York. Ebro in the morning. On Hot 97. Ebro in the morning. Laura Styles. Hi. You know what's even better than Ebro in the morning? What? It's e- just me and you? Yeah. <laughs> Ebro in the morning. No, Ebro. And you replace Ebro with the legendary Ice Cube yay! in the building. Yeah, yeah. What's happening with y'all? Yo, lot, yo, what's going on with you, Cube? You got a lot going on right now, bro. Well, first of yeah. all, I want to say congratulations. because We saw some of the pictures and the footage for your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Thank you. That was big. Now, we saw so many people that came to support you. I saw Yo-Yo was there. MC yeah. Ren. Who else was there? Oh, man, everybody. My man, Sir Jinx, was there. Uh, <laughs> DJ Pooh. Oh, man. It's like everybody from my history. Uh, Layla. Uh, you know, it's like... It has I, to be... When I looked out, and it was just so many people that's been there along the I way, know. you know, and uh, so I had to shout them out, you know. It has to be crazy, especially growing up in Los Angeles and just, like, at one point, just, you know, walking down Hollywood Boulevard yeah. and hanging out with your homies, and all I, of a sudden now it's like you're there with everybody else. It's a trip, because I, I used to ditch school, <laughs> and, you know, we would have to catch the bus, and it would take us through Hollywood to get back to the hood. And right. It's a trip because we'd walk those streets and look right. down, and I would know some of those people and some of them people I didn't know. But I never, I never like, imagined that I would get down there. So did you even, uh, I mean, listen, let's not forget also, let's go back to burn Hollywood, burn. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's been a long run, Cube. So yeah. was that even something that was aspirational for you, or it just wasn't even on your radar that you thought you'd end up in that spot? I didn't think I was qualified. You know, I didn't, I thought you had to, like, go to Juilliard or something right, to right. to be an actor, you know what I mean, or, or be in Hollywood. So, you know, I, it's something I didn't pursue, so it's something I never knew that, that I could even be a part of until working with John Singleton, you know what I'm saying, working with him, it was like I knew that, damn, this is somebody he went to school for, but he's telling me, yo, won't you write? Won't you get involved? Won't you you know, get involved in movies. And and it was just something that I felt like, let me give it a shot. And I was whack at first, so, you know what I mean? It's not well, like... When, when was it first? Like, when you were working towards Boys in the Hood? No, no. Doing Boys in the Hood, you know, I, I got my feet under me pretty quick. Because you did. But I'm just talking about getting behind the scenes. Like oh, got it, got it. Writing. Got it. You know, writing you know, treatments and yeah, stuff. My, yeah, sure, my that's first a two scripts, <laughs> My first two scripts wasn't up to par, and they didn't get made. But but Friday, which is my third script, got made. So, you know, it's if you believe that you can do something, you know, what I mean, even if you're trying it, you know, uh, if you fail at first, don't let that discourage you. Keep what, going. What was the process? And by the way, we're gonna get into all the stuff because Cube's here to promote Big Three, which is yeah. kicking off this weekend at Barclay Center. Yes. Um, and of course, Death Certificate 25, which is out right now on Interscope. That's right. Yes. A lot going on. But back to the, you starting a film. What was the process for you and DJ Pooh in in writing Friday? How how did how, creatively how did that work? Well, we was fans of uh, shows like In Living Color. We was fans of uh, movies like Hollywood Shuffle. Uh, Robert is, Townsend. Yeah, yeah, great. It's a great movie. Um, and we was like, yo, Robert Townsend. You know, he did that with credit cards. He made that movie basically. It was like two hundred thousand, and he just pieced it together. So. Me and Pooh was like, we can do that. You know what I mean? Let's start writing a movie. And we'll piece it together. And so we started writing. So that was the the jump off because we were, we felt like if if Robert Townsend could do it and make a movie that funny, then we could too and make a movie about our hood. Cause, you know, at the time, what was out was Boys in the Hood, Menace to Society. It was a it was a movie called South Central, which so, was which was even dark. I mean, South Central was a dark. These were yeah, pretty dark movies. Dark movies, mm-hmm. but we were you know growing up, we like damn. Was it was it like that? Or didn't we have some fun? Right, in the right, right, I mean, right, right, yeah. I don't remember it that like dire. You right. know what I'm saying? So, like even we past like, all the negative stuff that was happening in the neighborhood, you still managed to crack smiles and jokes. I mean, and, you, know, you know, it's it's dark. <laughs> it, I mean, Friday has dark humor yeah. in it, but it's humor. It's how we envision it. It's how we mentally survive the neighborhood is making fun out of stuff that, you know, usually would make you cry. And did you guys, like, did you remember what your ritual was for writing? Like, did you guys have a set thing you did? You got together at a certain place? We just start throwing ideas at each other. And I was on the road, actually. Uh, I was in Europe. I, I wrote that script in Europe. With DJ Pooh on the phone, you know, so wow. we're on the phone basically 
you know, I'm sending him pages and, you know, we just going back and forth till we had a script that was way too long. <laughs> <laughs> it was way too long. And then um, Pat Charbonnet, who's a producer on the movie and who was my manager at the time, she helped us shape it. She helped us get it down where it was, you know, it looked like a movie. You when, you, right. when you were putting together, like, the characters, did you already, like, did you know you wanted Chris Tucker? No. Actually, DJ Pooh was supposed to play Smokey. He he plays Red now in Friday, but he was supposed to play Smokey. And um, it was going down. And once New Line picked up the movie, they were like, Q, you know, you, you only did a few movies. And Pooh has never done a movie. And I don't know if if we can let him, you know, I mean, he has 98 pages of dialogue. Right, right, right. You know right. what I'm saying? <laughs> In the movie. Uh, and then we can trust that. That's a lot. A lot of comedic chops. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, um, we was forced to, to you know, look for people. And there was other people named. And um, I had seen Chris Tucker on Def Comedy Jam. You know, that's Russell Simmons' uh, OG right. uh, show. And, and he was just dope. And he was just... What I envisioned with Smokey would be, right. which, which is, you know, just a, a young fool, you know, that's your friend. Was, and was we there, all got him. Was there any other comedians from that original Def Comedy Jam era that you considered for the Smokey part before Chris got it? No, no. I mean, but we did get Bernie Mac from there. You know, he's, a, he's in there as the, as the preacher. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I mean, Russell Simmons is, is the man for, you know, he's, he helped start you know, this 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 hip hop thing and, and blow it up to what it is today. And with comedy, he did the same thing. He so put true. a lot of people on the map, you know, that, you know, I get credit for, but it's really Russell because Russell put him on Def Comedy Jam and put and put him in front of the world. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. He was so and now he's doing it with all Def Digital too. So Yeah, you know, so you know, he's one of our forefathers, you know, iconic figures in hip hop. And a genius when it comes to bringing, you know, what we see as raw talent, street talent, talent that the world don't, you know, really get a chance to to see, uh, bring it, you know, to the stage where the world can see it and appreciate it and turn these guys into big stars. Now, in the endless list of uh, Ice Cube news of of recently in, in 2017 was your appearance on Bill Maher. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing you were already booked for that show. Yeah, I was already booked. So tell okay. me about the process for you and it happens yeah. and then how it plays out, what your thought process was and and just take us through. I thought, by the way, I just want to tell you, like, that conversation that you had, you know, for a lot of people, that's foreign territory. For yeah. us on this show, me being a white guy in hip hop, working with Ebro and Laura, people were very... It's a conversation we've had in here a million times. Yeah. And I just thought the way you handled it, you said what well, one thing I thought that was just so simple, because sometimes I just want to look for the words to, to say to people, but naturally it doesn't come out of me appropriately because it's, it's not, even though I care about this issue, it's not my issue specifically, was mm -hmm. when you said how about it doesn't matter how people say the N-word, doesn't matter what they mean by it, but when you hear it come out of a white person's mouth, it viscerally just hurts. It's, yes. and I thought that was so well said. But but take us through that process when you heard about it leading up to then doing the show. Well, I was booked to do the show because we wanted to promote, you know, death certificate. We, you know, put out the 25th year anniversary of that. Got three new hot songs. So I was ready to pump that, maybe talk a little Trump. Whatever, of course, the know, regular. Politics. Right. So when it happened, you know, my people came to me and said, uh, you know, what do you want to do? You know what I mean? And thought about it. And then I said, well, I want to do the show because I feel like it's a teachable moment. You know, not for Bill Maher, you know what I mean? But for all the Bill Maher's that's sitting there watching on their couch. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So who feel like they cool enough that they can cross that line. And so what I did was, you know, just really used it as that, you know, and... You know, when we went to the show, and, and I was surprised that Bill, like, came out just with his regular stand-up, you know what I mean? Like, kind of nothing ever happened. Um, and then with with uh, Eric Dyson, 
Uh, it was, it was cool, but I felt like, you know, I mean, he knew he was getting a pass, and it, that's what it felt like. He knew he was getting a pass, and so when I got up there, I, I just didn't want to just gloss over it. I didn't want to not say what I came to say. You know, what I mean, even though they had felt that they had moved on, but I just felt like, nah, it's still, you know, too much shit in there. Yeah, and you can't exactly what. Well, no one was trying to claim, I didn't think, that Bill was a racist. It wasn't about that. No. It was about it was about having it was about a sense of entitlement and 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 overly comfortable, being overly yes. comfortable. Yeah. That's why I asked him what went through your mind and made you think it was cool. Cause that's where the problem lies. What made you think I could say this? Uh, Cause that's where you need to check yourself. You know and I mean? also really uh, enjoyed the conversation and how you brought up just because you have a couple of black girlfriends or, or yeah. hang out with a group of people that you feel like you could get a pass. No, you can never get a pass. Never get a pass. You know, I mean, I got I got Mexican homeboys. You know, what I mean, I got yeah. you know uh, Asian homeboys, and I don't care how cool we get. I'm never going to cross any of those lines. It's a level of respect. Because it's all about respect. That's what it is. It's, I respect, you know, the people too much that I deal with to, mm -hmm. to have them thinking, you know, that I'm tripping. Right, right, right. How did you deal as an artist? I mean, you guys, you know, it's interesting to you to have the conversation of all people. Yeah. Because in terms of the N-word taking on a new meaning with a younger generation of white people, man, mm -hmm. NWA was a major piece of that yeah. as an artist how did you approach like seeing fans sing the words of your song that's cool that's cool but if it ain't no rap song going on <laughs> you're not singing along hey i edited what even you in the doing? songs bro what you doing no. you know uh i mean a song is a song i can understand that but you know it's like come on that to me i i think that's common sense you know uh if you rock it to a song hey the song say what it say Sing along. But when the song is over, it's over. It's over. Did you feel that you did you feel Bill's response was adequate? Were you cool with how it was with how it played out? Um I mean not I mean that's on him. That's on him. You know, I, I feel like if he felt like he got the message, I can't say he didn't. But I wasn't really talking to him. You know what I mean? He's just he was just there. I was really talking to the audience is really about who was watching more than Bill, you know. Is it, I'm guessing it's not lost on you. You know, one of the most talked about things, I think, for rap nerds, when we talk about all the amazing things this culture has done, is like the transformation of Ice Cube. You know what I mean? From America's Most Wanted, mm -hmm. li literally, I mean, and, and figuratively, to Are We There Yet, mm -hmm. right? And then now to the Walk of Fame. Yeah. Um, I just wonder, like, what it feels like for you when you revisit Death Certificate. And I watched the new video, Good Cop, Bad Cop, which is mm -hmm. you being right back on the cube we've always known, like really a provocative message. Um, is it complicated for you to sort of um, operate in, in, in these two worlds, or is it is it easy for you? It's easy. I mean, just be myself. That's all. And, you know, I hope I'm ex an example that... You can make it, you know? I hope I'm that example to people who, you know, feel like they start, they starting in one position, they want to make it to a to another level. Hopefully I'm that example. Um, if not, then it ain't gonna bother me. None. Are are you what about steps that we can take? There's a lot of there's a lot of power that's starting to be built in black Hollywood. But as we've had this conversation many times on the show with actors, producers, it, it is still a real challenge, you know? Yes. And what, what, what steps are you trying to take and what steps do you think we can take generally to sort of get to a better place with Hollywood, man? Because two years ago, the Oscars so white thing, I always thought that was sort of missed. The focus was wrong. Yes. People, people were focused on the color of the skin of the actors. They weren't focused on the opportunities that were being given. That is the biggest issue, I think, that faces Hollywood. And we've heard it from time to time with every black actor that comes here. It's like we see the same faces in the same rooms just getting the same roles. Because there's just not a lot of there's options. There's no opportunities. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like uh, you're dealing with distribution. You're dealing with 
you know, most countries are focusing worldwide now and not just America. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a lot of breakthrough we still need to make worldwide. Um, Do you think there's a problem that other – is there an issue that's not being spoken about that as racist as America is, there are other countries that are major markets who do not care to see and spend money on black film. Yes, I, I believe that uh, because, and I think it stems from uh, what's happening here in America. Um, you know, the world has eyes. They can see how we're treated and, you know, they don't want, you know, uh, if, if we're a culture that's pushed down, then these other cultures probably don't want to see our stories because they feel like, you know, they rather see, you know, a white story because in this society, you know, white people are really held up. So uh, I'm pretty sure it has some kind of adverse effect because, you know, we are the, the inventors of movies here in America. So, um, you know, I'm pretty sure the world takes our lead, you know. Uh, I mean, even here. So... It's not like black films are all over the place. You know, they come out every mm. every now and then. Uh, and other cultures, not just black, but other cultures too. So uh, I'm pretty sure the world takes that lead to some extent. Uh, but, you know, we breaking through. You know, Ride Along did great worldwide. Straight Outta Compton did great <laughs> worldwide. Um, so I think it's another thing too that's at play when it comes to culture. You know, some things just don't translate. You know, uh, some, you know, monsters, robots, cars, you know, all that's universal language. Aliens, dinosaurs, right, you know, all right. that fantasy stuff is universal language. So those movies have a, a better shot than, you know, barbershop, you know, where people, you know, in, in Germany might not know. Yeah, or can't connect. You know, or can, don't get the jokes can't connect and, yeah. with, you know, the south side of Chicago like that. So... Um, it's just, it's just, you know, it's really a mission to employ people. That's the mission I'm on. Just get movies made, get people employed, you know what I'm saying? Put some food on their table. You know, I think you start off with a simple mission and, you know, hopefully we can make it grow, but it, it comes down to distribution. It's, it's a big issue that's, you know, it's not just, you know, the execs are keeping us from doing good movies. It's just, it's a money game. You know, it's a distribution game. You know, racism is in so there's, there, So there's too. battles on multiple it's, fronts. It's a lot of battles. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about the movie you're making and who you hiring and employing and making sure people can eat. That's, a, that's really, as a filmmaker, that's all you can really count on is try to get a movie made so people can eat. Um, let's talk about Big Three for a second. Yes. How did this How did this become a thing that you wanted to do? And how did you take the steps to getting it done? I mean, just being a fan um, of basketball and seeing, you know, dudes like Kobe retire and score 60 points in their last game, it just seemed like, man, ha there has to be a place where we can see guys still play um, and not just – disappear you know we've been invested yeah. in these dudes man since That's a very good point high school some college pros and then they gone can where you, they go can you break it down for the audience that's watching it and doesn't know too much about big three can you break it down how it works and how the players are picked big three is professional three on three basketball it's played half court three uh players on the court per team uh going at it you know and a lot of people are familiar with three-on-three -three basketball because in the playgrounds, that's what most people play. Uh, backyards, schoolyards, it's mostly three-on-three. -three. So we just taking it from the blacktop, putting it inside the arena. I mean, the people at Barclay, been, I mean, they've been so amazing to us. I mean, you know, we couldn't have asked for... A, and that's a, the opening day, correct? Opening day, it, it'll be this Sunday, 1 o'clock. Okay. You know, uh, what's great about it, you buy one ticket, you get to see four games. Um, the games are to 60, so you won't be there all day. Okay. So, <laughs> so, but but you get to see 48 of your favorite stars, you know, like Allen Iverson and Chauncey Billups and so Kenyon Martin and, and uh, Jermaine O'Neal, uh, Rashard Lewis, 
Mike Bibby, White Chocolate, Jason Williams. You know, so we got some great uh, players that was former NBA stars, some all-stars, some champions. We got Hall of Fame coaches like Dr. J and uh, George Gervin, the Iceman, and uh, Gary Payton, who, who never stops talking. Yeah, <laughs> you know what's cool is we got a grown man league, and it, you know we letting a little trash talk. Right, I, yeah. I, that's what I was see. That yeah. was one of my things that I I was like, man, I hope part of it is yeah, give us yes. a little bit of that game that people can't get anymore. Exactly, in your face basketball. Um, you know, no profanity, but you know. You and can't. what about from a physical standpoint? How how do you have refs calling oh, they go these hard. games? They go so hard. It's going to be a little physical. Physical. We let we allow in hand checking, uh, which used to be allowed in the in the. Um, I think it got outlawed in the 90s. Hand checking is just being able to use your hands a little to keep the defender in front of you. And we believe three on three, the, f the floor is so wide, so much room that you, you got you to gotta be able to, to use your hands to play great defense. So we think we got a great game that people are going to enjoy. I think people, when they see this, um, and you got to come out to, to, to Barclay and check it out. When they see this, they're gonna say, "Man, how do we live without this?" Yeah. Is this uh, is this what's the TV situation? Yeah, for I was this just weekend? gonna ask, is it being broadcasted? Yes, anywhere? It's, on, it's on broadcasted on Monday nights, uh, which is the next day, February. I mean, I said February, uh, June twenty sixth. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm getting mm -hmm. my dates. Mixed. No, no, I get it. Yeah, that's June twenty sixth. Every Monday night, we got Monday night basketball, okay. eight to eleven Eastern. Um, and you'll be able to see on it. on yes, FS1 on FS1 okay. FS1 Great. Fox yeah. so FS1 Monday night you'll see what happened on Sunday yes it's gonna um, be great I gotta tell you I think it's a really exciting opportunity um, what's the standard for success like how do you say when you're starting a new league you know like you I, you probably saw the thirty for thirty yes. about Vince McMahon doing oh, the yeah. XFL oh yeah I did. right yeah so, so it's very these these this moments you know Donald Trump. With the USFL, there have been yeah. these moments that have happened, mm -hmm. and it's an exciting opportunity. How do you gauge success for Big Three? I mean, fan interest, you know, growing interest, you know, from week to week. Uh, what's cool is we play every week, so for 10 weeks. Uh, every game counts, you know, it's none of this resting players and all this stuff. Um, I think success is sponsor interest, you know, um, on a major scale. Um after this year, we're gonna hopefully, hopefully Fox will be interested in doing a uh, major TV deal. So you know, we got a few you know benchmarks we looking at that we think you know if we hit those, you know we on to something. Now you know, the the difference between our league and most of those other leagues, we're starting off with superstars already. Very good point. And most of those other leagues are starting with unknown players that right, you never right, heard right. of. That's actually that's exactly yeah. right. So we we feel like we got a leg up. Uh, there's already interest in taking this to Asia. And, they would. You have to think Asia know, would love, it. without a doubt. We're, the, we're three Irishman's three, God still. I three know. on three is bigger in Asia than it is than five on five. You know, they play three on three in stadiums out there. Five on five is played in arenas. Isn't three there. on three going to end up in the Olympics? Yes, that's the conversation. Twenty twenty, it's in the Olympics. Which, by so. the way, that has to be great for your business as well. It is because, you know, it 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 basically uh, legitimizes us from day one. Uh, you know, we've been contacted by USA Basketball, um, so we we just feel like you know it's just, it's just a great sign. We're on a mission from God, man. You know what I mean? Like the Blues Brothers. We're on a mission from God, straight up. This sounds like it's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm very excited about this. Y'all got to come out, man. Yeah, How, man. How's AI look physically? I know. That's What's, what I want to know. That's what everyone wants to know. I mean, he's training. He looks good. You know, we got a tape of, of him. If you go on you know, big3.com, you can see him uh, working out with his ex, well, his old high school coach. That's, that's so, tight. Yeah, he getting busy, man. You know, that, that crossover is still killing. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, who's the dream player for you to get? I mean, Kobe Bryant. Kobe. Yeah, that's the dream. Now, that's got to be your man, though. Yeah, that's my man. Um, you don't want to play yet. <laughs> did you try I, to? Hit, did you hit him yet with of, the direct proposal? Of course. Okay. But, you know, I think, like, a lot of guys are going to watch, see what we do this yeah, year. Yeah, I'm sure. And uh, next year they'll be able to, to join in. You know, what's cool is guys are going to be returned every year. And, you know, if they want to still play basketball without going overseas, without – you know, doing that thing and come play with the big three. Um, okay, so now it turns out that the the final day of the big three's inaugural season, yes, 
is August 26th yes. at T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. <laughs> yes. So I know you said earlier in the week that there's a price. Mm. Can you give us a ballpark on what this price looks like for you to give up the arena to Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather? Because we know they're going to make a lot of money that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, but that, that's that's their money. You know, we're not, we not going to go crazy. We just want to, you know, be treated fair. That's all. That's it. Well, and you how know? are you going to opt? Like if you, so if you give it to them, yes. which presumably you'll, you guys will figure it out. Well, we're working something out. We're still on the date. So okay. until, you know, until we work it all the way out, then it's still our date. But, and then where will you go? What will you do? Uh, we're looking at the MGM. Okay. So, you know, we still got to, you know, to me, we got a great opportunity to have a a big sports day in Las Vegas. You know, our our game is at 1.30. His fight is at 6.30. So right. So everybody it, keeps... It's the opportunity to have a, a major... Uh, day in, in Las Vegas, a major sports day. So it's just going to, I think it's all going to work out. You know, Floyd's my man. Uh, so I, I just think we're going to work everything out. Uh, what do you expect to happen in the in the Floyd Mayweather, Conor McGregor fight? <laughs> <laughs> um, no contest. I think Floyd going to beat him pretty easily. Uh, I just hope he don't just go MMA on Floyd in there and just get mad and <laughs> that's what I, that's what I said. Remember I told you say, that? Forget this. Just to kick him and say enough go. is enough? Yes. It would be very entertaining. Well, Floyd got to say, hey, man, you, you kick me, you don't get no money. So <laughs> I put that in the contract. Um, wh what is your what is your uh, initial reaction to the first uh, four or five months of Donald Trump America, Ben Cube? Um, a circus. It's, it's what America gets. <laughs> What you get for putting that dude in there? And what is there? What was the, what was the in your household? What was the um, um, initial reaction to election day like in the Jackson household? Uh, they so sick of brothers they'll put any white man in there. <laughs> That's what we felt. They so really? sick of Obama they'll put anybody they can find in there. Yep. And that is a great way of putting it, because how else could you justify this completely unqualified candidate getting in there? I have no idea. I don't know how people can do that to themselves. Um, have you uh, have you gotten to share any experiences with uh, President Obama over the years? No, I've never met him. Really? No. Is that on the list? Is he is he someone that you would uh, be pretty excited to meet? Yeah, I want to meet him now. Cause then I can get all the dirt. Now you have real. <laughs> he always said the same thing. Yeah. He wants that real, real talk. Now. He always. Said I want to hear no formal. He's not president. I no formal. You know, I don't want that. You I want? want the, I want the real man. Come on, uh, holler at me. I uh, I, I've taken some heat uh, at times. Cube, not not a lot of heat. But I've taken some at really standing up and saying that I think uh, not only is Kendrick Lamar the the best rapper in the world right now. But that he needs to be in the conversation with the all-time greats. Like I think it's time to. I think at a certain point you have to start acknowledging that people who are active deserve to be in that conversation with the Ice Cubes and these and people who who we consider legends. Um, what do you think about where Kendrick Lamar is at in his career right now? I mean, I think he's incredible. Um, you know, being an artist. It's it's hard to say, you know, because coming up, I wanted to be, I wanted people to to equate me with the greats, you know. What I mean, I didn't want to wait till I got here, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I understand that. Do you um, feel like people? I feel like people did though with you. I feel like midway through your career, people yes. gave you a really high level of respect, without a doubt. I mean, it's been it's been that way, you know, for you know, probably since dropping, you know. Death certificate, maybe it's it's you know I, I've gotten a lot of love um, and a respect from pretty much from day one. Uh, so you know I don't think you know an artist like that you know um, is gonna make any mistakes. Like you know I think he's gonna you know do records that you know people love. You know when you're an artist like that, you do records. Sometimes people don't understand, but that's cool too because. Once they know that you, you know, are a painter and not just a rapper, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Then people accept all kind of stuff from you. So and I believe that he's definitely on his way to just solidify a spot. 
you know, with, with with some of the greats because the way he produces his music is is pretty unique. Uh, so, you know, I just think when you're unique, you make your own spot, you know, even before you get there. So I, I think Kendrick is unique enough to do that. It, who else? Is there anyone else young in, in the in this generation that you're excited about and you hear and you go, it makes you proud as as one of the, you know, you're one of the true, true icons and minds of this game that you appreciate? Um, you know, it's a lot of people that's that's great, you know. I mean, all of them seem, you know, younger than me. So when you say younger generation, I'm looking That's a very at, good point. I'm looking at uh, you know, people like Kanye and Lil Wayne and I'm still looking at those guys cuz I think those guys are there. You know what I'm saying? They they just they there. They just got to keep doing good music and uh younger than that, you know, they still got work to do. You never know when guys are one hitter quitters or you just never know. So I always like guys to, to give me at least three, four records. Before you're ready to start, start. putting them in, in kind of categories. What do you uh I've never I've never heard you really talk about Hove. Um and you guys are similar in age, right around the same age. Um, because Hove's been around a lot longer than the people realize, you know, going all the way back to Jazz O. So what you saying about me? You're very young and spry. <laughs> um <laughs> Dude, when you look at Hove though, and yeah. I know Hove admires you, but when mm -hmm. you look at someone like Hove, like, do you think of him as like, I, in my mind, you know, I, I do. I think of him in, in a very special category, all to himself, with what he's done with the with this culture and the business in general. How do you think of what what Jay Z's done? Oh, he's amazing. You know, he's not a businessman. He's a business man, which is cool. You know, that's what it's all about. It's about showing the world that you got other talents then you know they try to pigeonhole you you know they still call me a rapper you know what i'm saying do you still get does that happen yeah yeah yeah. well like rapper ice cube yeah i mean on the bill maher show it said rapper ice cube <laughs> which is cool uh, but i mean it's but, one side of you <laughs> but somebody you know you just look at somebody like jay-z as a brilliant mind that's uh that understands the business understands the culture you know um and I think he's great, you know what I mean? I think when we all look at each other, I think there's motivation there, you know? Um, and I'm motivated by what Puffy do, I'm motivated by what Dre do, uh, Jay-Z. Um, you know, these guys do motivate. I think we motivate each other. Right. Because um, we're all going for a higher level than people expected us. You know, everybody expect, okay, Q, you did him. You did just stop. Oh, damn. Uh, now you producing moves. Okay, stop. Oh, damn. Now basketball. You know, it's like you can't stop this. It, it's just going to keep rolling. And if one idea don't work, just live long enough. You'll see another one come from people like us. Did you get a chance to catch um, the documentary, the Khalif Browder documentary that he helped put together? The which one? The Khalif Browder documentary that he helped nah, put together nah, about the young that. man who was uh, incarcerated in uh, Rikers Island and he was abused and eventually he ends up killing himself, but basically exposing all the craziness that happens, the, the corruption that, that yeah. happens in uh, Rikers Island. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I want to check it out. Yeah, Hove, Hove produced the documentary. It was just, it was just pushing it to another level. Yeah. Just another thing of like saying, not only will we make entertainment and make film, but making things that are like truly educating and enlightening people as well. Um, I mean, it's very exactly. cool. Exactly. I mean, you know, it's like, like I said, you know, Jay Z is amazing. He, um, I mean, he put a basketball arena in Brooklyn. You know, he helped <laughs> that happen. So it's like, you know, this dude is. Uh, Keep watching, you know, he's gonna he's gonna keep amazing. Do you feel when people say check yourself in casual conversation that they sort of are indebted to you in some way? <laughs> nah, you know, check yourself. That was going around my neighborhood. I know it was, but you years, still but... took it to another. <laughs> but... What about if someone says chickity check yourself? <laughs> what about uh you know, it's always cool to take the culture and, and you know, and and everybody rock it to it, but at the end of the day, it's probably some Dude in the hood somewhere. Some that random, invented yeah. that. Oh, know, he hates you, one too. One day, just, man. Ice Cube. Such He's like, Ice Cube always stealing <laughs> my <laughs> shit. My, yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, that's just, that's just <laughs> you know, things are always going to pop up. And, you know, the entertainers are going to get the credit. But usually that stuff starts somewhere on the street. 
Boy. Cube, so the last Friday movie, that that really that's it's official. It really is happening. Yeah, we're working on it. Okay, we're so working it's on it. okay, I had a okay. Few cool meetings. I ain't gonna tell you with who. All right, all right, really? all right, all right. So so, do, so I heard a little bit, but I haven't heard that much buzz about it. And so it's last deal, Friday, so. yeah, we're in the early stages. Okay. okay. We're in the early stage. We're still writing. Okay. And okay, and okay, what okay. else do you have coming in the next in the next little period here? What what more movies, et cetera, do you have coming? Big three. Big three is it right that's now. It. All right. I well, mean, listen. I'm I'm laser focused on that because, you know, it takes a hell of a lot of work to, 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 you know, create a league, promote a league, market a league, and uh, what is your are you, is your title like CEO, president? What's no, your? No, just a founder. Founder. Yeah. But you're yeah. heavily involved in everything. Yes. Okay. Heavily, you know. And, uh, and what are the cities y'all going to after Brooklyn? We we going to Charlotte next, then um, I believe it's Tulsa, then Philly, um, Lexington. Chicago, uh, Seattle, uh, L.A., and Vegas. And Vegas, round yeah. it up. Yeah. What? Where can people find the, the schedule and all the information for Big 3? You can go to Big3.com, and if you want to um, come to the game this this Sunday uh, in Brooklyn, you know, you can go to Ticketmaster and, and pick up some tickets. What's cool is, like, if, you, if you're 13, you go to the box office with an adult, the adult buy the ticket, 13 year old get in free. Oh, that's But that's you got to go to the box office. You got to go to the box okay, office. Okay, okay, yes. okay. 13 and under. 13 and under free, though. Yes. That's tight. As long as, long as you would have paying an adult. That's really dope. It's cool. Love so we're trying to do things, you know, to bring people out and expose them to three on three basketball yeah. and let them get a chance to see these legendary players that, that you don't get a chance to see play no more unless you got, you know, YouTube. Yeah. Are the, uh, how affordable are the tickets? Very affordable. You know, our, 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 uh, our ticket is, starts at $27. Okay, great. $27. So it's also an opportunity to see people up close, too. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Get a good seat to see some of these icons who could still go. Without a doubt, you know. And I'm pretty sure, you know, they're going to go hard when they see all them people. And, you know, it's it's going to be fun for them because these dudes, all they play now is really a lot of pickup. You know, some guys are from overseas, but they, they haven't played in front of an American, you know, crowd. Uh, for a long time, so it's gonna be cool. I'll tell you one thing. I um I was fortunate enough, and our audience knows because I've talked about it ad nauseum, to play in the celebrity game this year. Oh yeah. God! Caught, I caught that assist from White Chocolate. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what. He was toying around with people. White Chocolate could still play, without a doubt. You know that's why we, you know, he was one of the first people we we asked to play in our league because you know he still got it, and he's you know he's an iconic figure. You know, like Iverson. Yeah, it's going to be very cool. Big three Big this three. Sunday uh, at the Barclays Center. Death certificate, 25 years out right now. Yes. Um, And 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 m much more to come from Ice Cube. Cube, anytime. You know the door is always open here yeah, permanently. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, man. Thank you for setting Bill Maher straight. We appreciated that. No doubt. No <laughs> doubt.